Liberty Me. I'm Kyle Platt here with Dr. Steve Horowitz. Steve Horowitz is Professor of Economics at St. Lawrence University. Steve, so great to have you back on. Glad to be back, Kyle. Good to see you. So recently there was this kerfuffle uh, between Dr. Peter Betke and uh, he saw something on the SFL blog that seemed to indicate that there was a misrepresentation of Hyatt going on with the SFL training. And that brought you to write this great article, Liberty, Come Play on My Lawn, or Come Play on The Lawn. Uh, it doesn't have to be your lawn, it could be anyone's, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a community lawn. But the point of your article was basically saying that these young people in the movement, and there's been a huge influx largely due to Ron Paul and some other factors, they might misrepresent, or at least in your mind, in the mind of the elder statesmen of libertarianism, misrepresent some of the libertarian thought throughout the years. But perhaps we should give them a little bit more leeway. Can you uh, expound upon that a little? Yeah, and again, I, I'm not, I mean, I think there's kind of two separate issues going on here. I, the, the misreading of, of intellectuals and socialism, that particular essay, I think is one issue. My concern is more, and I wouldn't call it a misrepresentation of libertarian issues, because one of the things I tried to do in that essay was to encourage young people to sort of bring their new toys and their new ideas and their new modes of expression to the, to the lawn of liberty, rather than tell them to get off my lawn. Um, but that, that whatever we do, the, the commitment has to be to quality arguments and quality evidence, and that we can't put anything else ahead of that. We can't put, you know, uh, appealing to the left. We can't put getting clicks or links or likes. We can't put, in, you know, just getting people, say, from the left to, to, to comment on our, our blogs. That's not the goal. The goal is to get the ideas right, and in that sense, you know, th that's what it's ultimately about. And whatever my disagreements with my you know, friend of 30 years, Pete Betke, um, we agree on this. Uh, and that, that, so my, my point in that piece for the Freeman was simply to say, look, the, the complaints of us old folks are not that you're bringing new ideas to the table. It's not that you want to talk about sexuality and gender. In fact, you know, I didn't put all this in that essay, but you know, some of us have been talking about those issues for a long time. So that's great. Um, but the problem is a kind of uh, uh, not making the best arguments, you know, the Bastiat quote about good causes ineptly defended. And I just want to, I want young people to understand how important it is to, the, to their commitment to liberty to make good arguments. And that when they are called in those arguments, they need to accept that not as a criticism of what they're writing about or as a criticism of them as people or, or gendered or, ra or you know, determined by race or, or you know, any other privilege, whatever. It's about making good arguments. And that they, sh and again, this is going to sound more harsh than I mean it, but in some sense, they, you know, they should be thankful that there are people out there who are willing to take their arguments with enough seriousness to, to assess them critically and to point out where they can be better. Um, I, I had a not person on my Facebook page recently say, you know, couldn't understand why young libertarians might wouldn't be grateful for the engagement of of serious scholars. I mean, it's really hard to find that elsewhere in other political ideological movements. Uh, so, you know, the opportunity when this guy was saying, even my undergraduate thesis advisor didn't give me as much engagement as people like you and Pete and others give to to young libertarians. So, again, I'm not, you know. I don't want to make it sound like like you know you should be grateful and shut up. But what I want to say is at least understand that we're trying to make we want you to make the arguments better. No, I would agree with that completely. That is just a superb faction or factor in the libertarian movement. Uh, the engagement is is wonderful, and I I, I do think we should cherish it. Uh, I'd like yeah. to say that as someone who has been through the SFL training, I think that they do have a very solid understanding of Hayek and and of thinkers just in general. Uh, but maybe this was just kind of an outlier. I, I think that's well, the case. Yeah, oh. and and I'm not I'm not. Sh it's not clear whether S whether his his charge is correct. So let's let's kind of talk about that for a second. Okay. Right? okay. In, in that essay, the intellectuals and socialism, Hayek's offering a model of of social and political change, and he makes this point. There's this sort of we call it intellectual structure of production. You have people, you know, engaging the abstract philosophical ideas. You have what he calls the secondhand dealers and ideas. Who are the intellectuals who you know who translate that sort of you know uh, academic work into popular work, and that includes you know a wide Hayek says the intellectuals include you know columnists and actors and actresses, and I mean anyone who's engaged in the world of ideas, those secondhand dealers, and then you have you know people uh, at the sort of retail level, right? The activists who are out there 
trying to get votes or or you know do rallies or these sorts of things. And what Hayek's point there is is that you can't get good work out of the secondhand dealers or the activists unless they have a really solid grounding in the primary early stage what we call you know early stages of production in those basic in the philosophical economic uh, ideas and so you can't just run out and try to change the world as an activist or you can't just go be a blogger or a newspaper editor in the cause of liberty without understanding those deeper issues that's not how it works so Pete's point and it was that and I think it's the correct reading of that Hayek essay is yes there's a division of labor there but that division of labor is dependent upon the early stage products the, uh, the basic ideas being correct uh, and being solid and then being understood by the second handers and the activists. What Pete seemed to believe was that young people are being told no you can just go work those later stages of production as an activist or a blogger or whatever without really having to know the earlier stuff, the, the, the deeper ideas. I don't think that's the message that I've seen Students for Liberty or Institute for Humane Studies or anyone else, at least in my experience, push. Um, there are certainly people young people in the libertarian movement who have expressly said well we don't need that stuff th those I old ideas we could just go out and push push our own ideas and act be activists in our own way I think that's wrong but I don't think they're getting that at least in my experience from things they've heard from SFL for the most part or IHS again that's my experience I think my friend Pete is sort of using students for liberty as a kind of cover term for young libertarians and and the arguments he's making are much more true of other organizations having done some stuff with young americans for liberty the fact is they're just more activist oriented they just care more about you know changing the world on the ground floor they're much less concerned with ideas the whole point as i understand it of creating students for liberty several years ago was to find a venue for young libertarians to engage the world of ideas and to help provide that context for the things they wanted to do but again that's the you know Pete and I don't disagree we just the disagreement between us on this is about the degree to which those organizations are responsible for the trend that we both think is problematic definitely well and we see the issue especially in libertarianism uh, a movement which is relatively small compared to non-ideological movements such as uh, Democrats and Republicans. I say non-ideological because, as you would probably agree, they're not really based in any kind of intellectual thought. It's more just about winning political races, yep. and they'll yep. change their opinions or their, their, their views based on what will win. Uh, our movement is small, but it's ideologically based. So we see the issue with individuals not understanding, um, as Jeff Riggenbach would say, the, the libertarian tradition. It's, impo it's important to understand the libertarian tradition. Uh, right. There are individuals that I can think of off the top of my head, I don't want to name names, who don't understand the libertarian tradition and are just running around talking about, I should be able to do whatever I want, I should be able to say whatever I want, and, and no one should be able to stop me. And this yep. is just a misunderstanding of libertarian tradition. And yep. uh, as, as you said uh, so well, actually it's a, it's a quote from Bastia, um, the, uh, a, a position ill-defended, I'm, I'm yeah. paraphrasing of course, yeah, but yeah. a position ill-defended is, is the worst, is the worst right. thing to do. Right. And, and I think the other point I want to make here too, is that one of the reasons that I'm concerned with the question of people's engagement with the libertarian tradition is there is this sense among some young libertarians that they're inventing something new when they talk about particular subjects or when they engage the left or when they you know talk about gender and sexuality issues or when they talk about postmodernism or 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 you know all these things and the fact is if you actually read even the the you know let's call it the post mid 70s the post libertarian revival literature you don't even have to go back to the old stuff go back to the old stuff and you'll find people like Suzanne La Follette and Voltaire de Clare and you know engaging feminists there was libertarian feminism back then it's not a new thing Okay, and they were awesome, by the way, too. Yeah. Right? But even since the 1970s, we've had people engaging that work. Um, we and and again, I'm, just to take my own example, I've been writing, I've been teaching about uh, gender, family, and sexuality since the mid 90s. I've been writing about same-sex marriage issues since the mid and late 90s. Um, I, I've written on feminist economics. I mean, these are you know been there, done that. Okay. 
And if you want to engage those issues, don't pretend like you're like like no one has done this before, and that you're sort of inventing this new thing and serving this important purpose. We've done it, right? We've engaged it. Many of us took what we thought was valuable, left what we didn't. If you want to engage those issues as a libertarian, you should be familiar with that tradition, <laughs> with that work. And again, I'm not. This isn't about me, all right? This is about plenty of other people who've engaged these issues in in all, in all kinds of ways. And it's just this sense of kind of uh, an, an unwillingness to admit that there's stuff out there that needs to be brought into the conversation uh, and this sense of sort of trailblazing when in fact not and and that again I, you know it, it, there's numerous examples of this with young libertarians and it's and it's uh, I think for me I think their arguments would be better they'd stop wasting some time you know retreading old ground if they were more familiar with the things that other people have said about these issues both in the last 40 years but in the last 150 as well I would agree. Uh, I think that it's great that you encourage young libertarians to explore those things and definitely do so with a basis of, of past readings of those things in libertarian thought. It also speaks to those who look at someone attacking uh, gender and sexuality through a libertarian lens or uh, any other systematic oppression or anything like that and, and say, well, this is just new kinds of libertarianism. You're trying to change libertarianism. But really, if we had a solid understanding of the libertarian tradition, uh, this is nothing new. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's fair to say extending it, right? You know, deepening it, applying it. Yes. That's, that's for me, that's come play on the lawn of liberty, right? You know, br bring those ideas, address them with liberty. But, but if you're going to want to address them qua libertarian, as a libertarian, recognize that there's, there's stuff out there that's been written that can help you. And if you're going to portray, if you're going to talk about libertarian ideas in those contexts of gender, sexuality, what a race, you know, privilege, oppression, whatever, you at least need to talk about those concepts accurately. Uh, and you need to make sure that, that again, you're engaging the things that, that are already out there. And, and don't, and, and again, don't pretend like people's objections to your arguments are, are because of who you are or what, or the subject matter you're talking about. As far as I'm concerned, I don't care about any of that, right? What I care about is are you getting it right or not? And, and if we're putting popularity or clicks or links or likes or anything else above our search for the truth and above our search for understanding the way the world works, we're going go, to we're gonna go the same way as the rest of these movements, which is down the toilet. Sure. If, if we want to be serious about changing the world in a libertarian direction, we got to get those things right and we got to worry about our, our accuracy as scholars and writers first. The change will come from that. And embrace debate, embrace criticism. You know, yes. I mean, if 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 you or or Dr. Betke wrote on my wall about something they thought I got wrong, I mean, that's exciting. People should see this as not, you know, like you were saying, the the old man on the lawn shaking the stick, saying, "Get off my lawn." It's more like, you know, this is great. This is engagement. This is yeah. the kind of thing that that causes ideas to grow and flourish. Yep. yep. And and again, it's not. You know, let's let me put it this way: the criticism is not the opposite, or, or, or you know, uh, the criticism is not the opposite of support. Criticism is a way to support the work that people are doing by trying to make it better. And I think that's the lesson that has to get across here. Rather than you know, people say, "Oh, we can't have libertarians fighting with each other," criticism isn't fighting. And if you put, you know, if you put peace in the sense of, you know, everyone joining hands and singing kumbaya and, and clicking like on everything that everyone else writes, that is a recipe for disaster. And that's not the way to, 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 to get intellectual and political progress. Being our own merciless critics, our, you know, criticizing our collective own work is the most fundamental way that we can support each other. Criticism and support are not opposites. They're not substitutes. They're complements. I'll finish with something related that, that I've found concerning recently, and I, I think it, it's definitely relevant to the topic. <laughs> One of the issues that I see as far as criticism goes in the libertarian movement is idolatry versus, versus respect. Uh, we can have respect for people's thought, whether it be you or any other professor or thinker in the libertarian movement and the libertarian tradition, yeah. But the problem is I think that a lot of young libertarians have clung on to certain thinkers and decided that these, these thinkers are infallible, that they've figured yeah. it all out. 
whether they be dead like Rothbard or living like you or someone else like Jeffrey Tucker. You know, the, the problem is that no idea should be infallible. That's no right. thinker should be infallible. And I mean, do you find it as important as I do to separate respect for someone's ideas versus idolizing that thinker? Yep. yep. And once again, the most profound way you can respect someone's ideas is to read them charitably and give them a really good criticism that tries to push those ideas forward. The irony is, is that this is what Rothbard did to Mises, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you, if, just to take that example, so if you're going to think Murray never got it wrong, right, you're, you're, you're not doing, you're not treating Murray the way Murray treated Mises, which he knew Mises didn't always get it right. He got it wrong sometimes. But I, but the, the thing you point to is, is absolutely correct. And, and, you know, the fact that someone says Rothbard or Hoppe or Mises or Hayek or whomever got something wrong doesn't mean we're not libertarians. It doesn't mean we're throwing out the whole thing. It means they got something wrong, right? They're human beings. They, they get things wrong. Um, and I think that difference between sort of, you know, worship or idolatry and respect is a really important one. As long as we understand that respect, what respect means or, or carries within it is the possibility of, 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 of generous, serious criticism. It's, you know, that's not the same thing as saying so-and-so is an idiot or so-and-so is a racist or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. But to say, you know, to, to really believe that this person is sincerely working towards, towards making a better understanding of the world, you have to point out that maybe this part of it's wrong. If, I mean, if we can't do that, we, we, are turn, we have turned libertarianism into religious dogma. And, and that's not what we want. We want it to be a living, growing uh, 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 you know, a, a adventure and ideas. And for the most part it is. But the more we hang on to this idea that, that you know, so-and-so got it right and, you know, just go read X, Y, Z and, and, and all settled, no, nah, it's, it's never settled. And, and, and that, I should say, is the great part about what young people have brought. They're bringing in fresh ideas, right, and, 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 and fresh things they want to talk about. All I'm saying is, yeah, let's talk about them, let's grow, let's expand, but let's do it with a recognition of where we've been before and the degree to which the tradition has already talked about those things and that you can draw on it to make your arguments better. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, that's absolutely what we should all strive for and work for every single day. Uh, it's been a fantastic conversation, uh, Steve, and thank you so much for being on. Thank you as always, Kyle. All right, have a great day. Take care.